So today we're going to um, do two things. First, we're going to calculate the um, uh, we're going to calculate the free energy of the Schwarzschild black hole from the action, as we discussed last time. Um, then I'm going to have a few words to say about quantum corrections to these calculations. And then we're going to move on to the ADS CFT correspondence. And I'll just start, probably just start to introduce that today. So the first thing I want to do is talk about the Einstein action briefly. So I assume you've seen the first term. Um, which is the integral over the manifold, let's say it's um, d plus, well, let me not say how many dimensional it is. So integral root g r. Um, there's another term, which some of you know about, but I'm going to explain briefly. And that's the boundary term. Um, which is called the GHY term or the Gibbons Hawking York term. Uh, so, what is this? This is so we have a manifold with boundary, um, and this is a boundary term which H here is the induced metric on the boundary, and K here is the extrinsic curvature, or rather the trace of the extrinsic curvature of the boundary as embedded in the as embedded in the full manifold. So we've talked about k before, it's the same k. Uh, and then there's one more term, which I'm going to come to uh, in a little bit. And that last term uh, is the counter term or subtraction term. Uh, exactly how to so so the first two terms don't don't care about the cosmological constant. If we want to add a cosmological constant, we just add it here. It's fine. The boundary term doesn't change. Uh, this procedure is about dealing with infinities that come up uh, from from infinite volume spaces, and um, so this one is it matters a lot what asymptotics you're talking about. Asymptotically flat space uses the subtraction method that I'll talk about um, right now. Asymptotic ADS uses a counter term method that um, is going to be on the homework and we'll use a little bit later. And um, well, if it's if it's uh, De Sitter space, De Sitter space is closed and there are no boundary terms, so it's not an issue there. Uh, so. Why is there this boundary term and where did that come from? Um, so why G H Y? Um, I'm just going to sketch this. Uh, the reason is that uh, we want the Variation of the action to be G, to be zero on some on solutions. Um, so, why is that an issue? Einstein action, integral root g r, um, then you get three types of terms. The first one uh, is the familiar one, uh, which gives you the Einstein tensor. So here, g mu nu is the Einstein tensor. So this is the thing that gives you the equation of the motion of general relativity. That's the integral over the whole manifold. Uh, then there are two types of boundary terms that you can get. So the boundary terms um, come from integrating by parts when you derive the equations of motion. There's a term that involves a variation delta g mu nu 
Uh, but there's another term which involves a normal derivative of delta g mu nu. So I'm not writing the coefficients, but this is the structure of the variation. And uh, this is bad. Why is it bad? Well, it's bad if we want to imply Dirichlet boundary conditions, which is usually what we do in gravity. So the Dirichlet boundary conditions um, are where we fix g mu nu on the boundary um, to be something, say gamma mu nu. And since that boundary, since the metric is fixed, uh, when we vary the action, we don't we consider only variations that go to zero at the boundary. So delta g mu nu on the boundary is just zero. Uh, well, this is not the right action to study these boundary conditions because um, solutions uh, of the Einstein equations that obey these boundary conditions will not be stationary. Under this, with this choice of action. So delta, the variation of root gr, uh, is not zero um, around solutions, because this term is going to survive. So the ghy term is designed to, to remove this term. The variation of the ghy term has two pieces. One is exactly this with a minus sign by design, and the other one adds something to this term. Um, but um, so I'm not going to let me just say that GHY removes this. Okay. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about where it came from. This is general uh, sort of good thing to keep in mind, is that boundary terms in the action are associated to choices of boundary conditions. And you know, we, we could have stuck with the original action, but then we couldn't use Dirichlet boundary conditions. We'd have to cook up some other weird boundary condition that was compatible with this choice of action. Uh, so this is true in general, that you have to the, these two things come together, the choice of boundary terms in the action, the, the choice of boundary conditions, and you have to make sure that, that, you're, that you're using uh, compatible choices there. Um, and um, so this is a choice, our boundary condition, like when we say we're doing gravity on some manifold, the boundary condition is a part of the, the definition of that theory. So we really have to say we're doing gravity with Dirichlet boundary conditions on this manifold. And then the right action to, to use is the one with GHY. Okay, any questions about that? Can you remember boundary conditions where you fix the normal derivative of the matter? Sorry, I missed the beginning. You say, are there any? Yeah, yeah. Like, why don't we impose boundary conditions where you fix the normal derivative? Um, we can. I've seen many papers talking about that. Um, the, there's going to be an energy flux through the boundary if you do that. Um, now, we might be OK with that, but it's sort of an open system now. Uh, so th I, th I think there's nothing wrong with that um, if we want to study an open system. So then we have to uh, add an other uh, boundary term to cancel. That's right. Yeah. That's right. We have to cancel the other one. Yeah. Yeah. We're now going to evaluate IE for the Euclidean short shield. So the metric is 1 minus 2m over r g tau squared plus gr squared 
over 1 minus 2m over r plus r squared the omega squared with tau identified by the inverse temperature, 8 pi m. And that's our usual Euclidean black hole with uh, the horizon at r equals 2m. Um, now, this is just infinite. There's no boundary. But we're going to put one in. Okay? And the reason we're going to do that is because um, if we just try to plug this into the action, um, we would get, well, if we, if we try to plug this into the, the, the Einstein action with no boundary term, we would just get zero. Uh, but if we were to plug it in with a fixed boundary, the reason we would just get zero is because r is zero, right? This is a vacuum solution. But if we were to cut it off somewhere and plug it in, and then take that cutoff to infinity and keep the boundary term, and then take that cutoff to infinity, we would get infinity. Okay, so it's a little tricky as to whether we're getting zero infinity or something in between. And so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to cut it off at r equals r naught, um, and then we're going to be careful about those boundary terms, and eventually um, include this subtraction in order to get a, a finite answer. So. This surface at r equals r naught is our is our boundary dm, and there's a normal vector field n, which uh, points in from that boundary. Um, so to calculate the action, we need r and k. R is easy. This is zero because it's the solution of the vacuum Einstein equations. Um, so we need to find k, the extrinsic curvature. Um, The unit normal, N, um, is a vector that is proportional to dr. It points in the r direction um, and has n squared equal to 1. And uh, so we need to cancel the 1 minus 2m over r in that norm, and therefore n that the vector n is um, 1 minus 2m over r to the minus 1 half the r. The induced metric on the boundary dm uh, is that I'll call Hij, uh, is just, well, to get the induced metric uh, in the line element on a, on a line of fixed r, we just set r to r naught. So, so this term drops out, and we just set r to r naught the other ones. Um, so let's say it's the same as g mu nu, um, but mu and nu just run over tau and theta and phi. So it's the same components. Um, and r is equal to r naught. The extrinsic curvature um, K I J. Remember the uh, one of the formulas that we had for that was the Lie derivative or half the Lie derivative along n of H I J, which in this case is just the derivative along n, so n mu d mu H I J. Um, so I'm not going to write the I'm not going to write that down, but you can take the derivative, and then finally the trace k is computed in, in the usual way by contracting the indices. Okay. 
Okay, so um, if we plug this into the GHY term then um, the integral at the boundary dm, which is the surface r equals r naught, integral d tau um, d theta d phi root hk, um, it gives integral d tau. So if we do the integrals over theta and phi, then uh, we get 8 pi r naught minus 12 pi m. I'm skipping a bunch of algebra, obviously, uh, plus things that are subleading in 1 over r naught. All right, so this is what happens when you go through the details of that calculation. And uh, in particular, this is infinity because we want to take the cutoff R naught uh, to infinity in order to get the, the action of the whole black hole. So that's where we add the subtraction. So the subtraction in flat space is pretty weird. It's pretty weird. Okay, let me write the formula. Um, it's, here's what we do. We, we shift the Euclidean action. Um, so the boundary term, which was um, so we shift the extrinsic curvature in the boundary term. Okay, so before it was just root h k. Now we subtract off k naught. So what is k naught here? K naught is the curvature of the boundary as embedded in flat space time. Okay, so in other words, you 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 have this manifold. looks like this. Um, we cut it off here. Now, it's not quite in, it, it, it knows that it's not in flat space. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that same boundary is in flat space um, and use that to define the subtraction. OK, is this weird? Well. I guess it's reasonable because it's, it's, it's designed to make sure that the answer is zero in flat space. So we're kind of going to be, we end up comparing to flat space. Um, but it's still pretty weird. Like, if I had put a, H, if I had put a root h naught, k naught here, like if we just tried to subtract off um, in that way, it, it would give the wrong answer. Um, and I guess the, the, the best way to think about it is that this is just something that works in flat space. Actually, all this stuff is way better defined in asymptotically ADS. And when we get there, uh, there's going to be a very natural interpretation of what it means to add these subtraction terms. They're going to be... Uh, they're going to be very similar to how we do renormalization in quantum field theory. Um, but I'm a little uneasy about this one. Always have been. I think we should all be a little bit uneasy about it. It's just how you do it. Yeah. Um, so maybe kind of in the same way how when we do quantum field theory, we could, instead of adding the counter terms, we could just put a finite high energy cutoff and like work with that cutoff and uh, 
never actually take into infinity. Just, if we do the same thing here, just to keep okay. the well, boundary finite. Um, yeah, in QFT, I, I think you can, you can do that because it gives the same answer. Here, um, I, here it's, I think it's a little worse. Like here, um, if we try to, so there's going to be a nice counter term method that we use in ADS. If you try to use that here, it does not work. Like it, it, you can't find a counter term. So that makes me slightly worried that this isn't quite well defined or something. Um, and um, so I think, I don't think anybody is fully satisfied with this way of defining things. I mean, it works pretty well. It's going to give, it's going to give, it's going to give reasonable answers. It's, it's the, it's the best way to do it. But it's just, uh, it's, I don't, I don't have a, a great explanation for it. Sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah. So the the root, if you had instead of root root h not in front of the k not, that would be just saying um, what we care about are not the partition function, but correlators in which you divide by the vacuum partition function. And so you're subtracting off, you're only looking at physical things. So you're always dividing your infinity by another infinity. If I put the H0 in there? If you well, the H0. The, the issue with the H0, there's an issue with the, that when you compare two manifolds, it, it's, it's tricky how to compare them. You have to say what you're holding fixed when you compare two manifolds. And um, I think that the fact that this is an H instead of an H naught or something is, a, is you could think of that as a definition of how to compare the two manifolds in the sense that, like, which surface, we have to compare a cutoff flat space with a cutoff black hole. And how do we compare them by, how do we relate the cutoff between them? And, that's what this K naught does. I'm going to explain how, how we do that, but. Well, then, um, is, it, is it that strange? Because you often get infinite action things, but then you, it's fine because you're dividing it out by something which is infinite action as well, and then calculate actual correlators. You know, I, I might have been happier with it if it wasn't so much nicer in ADS. <laughs> um, just there, I, there, it's just that there's a totally nice covariant thing that, that's that's familiar from quantum field theory, where, um, well, I'll explain it later, but you're just, you just you can add anything here that's intrinsic to the boundary. You can add anything that's intrinsic to the boundary. You can add curvature of the boundary, all that kind of stuff. And you just add enough terms to, to make the divergences cancel, and then you're done. Uh, but we can't do that in flat space, so, so it seems a little worse. Yeah? So I have two questions. So in the ADS story, if you if you didn't know that there was a dual field theory, would it still be just as nice? I guess like when you said it, there's a nice way of interpreting it, but you were going to say that, you know. Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, let me let's come back to that later. But yes, I think it's I I think it's nice even if you don't talk about duality. Okay. And then the other thing was, I mean, and you know, there's a way to do all of this without actions at all, just working with the Lagrangian, right? And so no infinity. Sort. You mean to get the free energy? Yeah, yeah, or, or first law or other charges. Yeah, like that. yeah. Um, is that better? In your opinion? Then? Um, I think it's equivalent. I think it's equivalent. There's an equivalent step yeah. in that when you do it that way. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there a notion that any of these parameters are going to run with? Are there going to be any running with the parameters with the choice of boundary? Yeah, there is, especially when we get to ADS, where the where the where moving the boundary is really an RG is really a normalization group scale. Um, in in flat space, um, I guess you could say that it looks a little bit like that, but I don't know of any precise relation. Like justified because it is not changing the finite piece because the finite piece is responsible for giving the free energy. It does change the finite piece. 
uh, okay change the finite piece in a in a in a way that you want to uh, so that you can uh, explain the free energy also using thermodynamics um yeah yeah that's right I mean, yeah, there's a check that we're, that we're doing something reasonable, which yeah. is that we're trying to calculate a free energy, and we already know the free energy. It's energy minus temperature times entropy. Okay, so I agree. <clears throat> but um, designing it to get the right answer is not a totally satisfying uh, way of um, So to define k naught a bit more carefully, um, let's Red is the only one that's working, so everything's going to be very shouting at you. So, define an auxiliary space time, which is actually flat, uh, which is um, 1 minus 2m over r naught d tau squared plus dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. This is just Minkowski. Because that's not an R, that's an R naught. So I've just it's just Minkowski with a funny scaling of the time coordinate. Or sorry, not Minkowski, I mean Euclidean. This is R4. It's just flat. Um, and the reason I've written it this way is because the R equals R naught hypersurface here is clearly the same as the R equals R naught hypersurface in the black hole. And this is what I mean by taking that same boundary, that same boundary manifold, dm, same hypersurface, this gives us that hypersurface embedded in flat space now. So k naught um, is the curvature uh, is associated to dm in um, the auxiliary metric. So that's that's how we define that subtraction. So now if you go back and uh, you calculate the boundary term root h k minus k k naught, uh, it cancels off the infinity. And you get integral d tau minus 4 pi m plus order 1 over r naught. The tau integral is from 0 to 8 pi m, because that's the size of the Euclidean time circle. So uh, we get minus 4 pi m beta. Um, well, at this point, we've taken r naught to it. We, we now can safely take r naught to infinity uh, without getting any divergences. Um, so our final answer for the Euclidean action uh, if we plug in, beta is um, 8 pi m. Uh, there was a 1 over 8 pi in the GHY term. OK, so put all your pi's in and everything. And the Euclidean action that you get is 1 over 16 pi squared beta squared. OK, so that's the a, that's a calculation of the Euclidean action of Schwarzschild. I skipped some steps, which I'm going to ask you to do on the problem set. We can now do the path integral. As we described last time, the path integral um, on the, the gravity, the gravitational path integral, um, is calculated by the semi classical approximation. And the leading approximation is just e to the minus Euclidean action. So that's our calculation of the gravitational path integral to leading order uh, 
uh, from this short shelf metric. Let's check that we got something reasonable. Because once we have the free energy, we can calculate all the other thermodynamic quantities. We've already calculated those, so we can compare. Um, recall that the entropy is supposed to be one quarter of the area, which for short shield was 4 pi m squared. Um, so the usual definition of free energy is usual way of, of calculating it from the energy and entropy is an energy minus temperature times entropy, um, which if you um, plug in m for the energy, uh, 1 over 8 pi m for the temperature, and 4 pi m squared for the entropy gives you m over 2. And uh, we multiply that by beta. Well, remember z. Z is e to the minus beta times free energy. Uh, so if we want to compare the action, we should multiply by, by, that by beta. This is beta at m over 2. And that's uh, the same as 1 over 16 pi squared beta squared. So far, so good. We can do all the other usual stuff that we do with thermodynamics. We can calculate the energy at temperature beta. That's minus d beta log z. which gives, uh, plugging in our answer for the, for the action here, uh, this gives M. So that's good. If we want to check the entropy, uh, then the usual thermodynamic formula for that is 1 minus beta d beta log z. And I won't go through the algebra, but again, you're going to get back uh, the area over 4 of the black hole. So this really is thermodynamics. It really is calculating for us the free energy, and is really just acting like thermodynamics. Questions? So you started this regulation procedure in the uh, because the, you said that the action vanishes, right? On shelf. Well, yeah. If if you the bulk term vanishes. Yeah, the bulk term vanishes. So if you're not careful about the boundary terms, then you might think the answer is zero. Mm -hmm. uh, if you aren't careful about the counter terms, you might think the answer is infinity. But we did, we got the right answer. So usually I would expect if the action vanishes, I should go, uh, I should uh, like just calculate the one-loop determinant or something like that, right? But here... Uh, I think the, the idea that the action vanishes, that's really just an error not being careful about boundary terms. The action just never, it, do, it doesn't really vanish. Yeah. When this was first done, was it done in this way or, or did the trick of adding the counter term arise because we wanted thermo and everything to work out and then Properly. As far as I know, nobody bothered to calculate this action until they were trying to check thermodynamics, but I'm, I'm not sure. Because I can imagine a situation where, like, we've only picked the counter term we've picked because it happens to agree with everything. 
Um, well, I'm sure that's why people believed it. It is, it is okay, if, if, if you tried to come up with a counter term, this is a natural, it's the thing you would come up with. It's not like people tried 100 different counter terms and then like on number 100, they landed on one that they gave the free energy they wanted. Yeah. It's a natural thing to write. I don't know why we couldn't write. I don't know. That. Yeah. How about that? Why isn't that the why isn't that the why isn't that the battery term? Um, and um, that's what we can do in ADS, and it works great. So so that's that's why I'm dissing flat space. <laughs> Other questions? Do you think life would be better if we lived in ADS? Sorry? Do you think life would be better if we lived in ADS? Uh, in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> Quantum corrections. Okay, so. We've calculated just the classical term, just the leading term uh, in this semi-classical approximation. Um, so let me write down for you again the semi-classical approximation. It's the sum over saddles of e to the minus classical action on the saddle um, times the quantum corrections. So this I call Z Q of T the G bar. I think I wrote this down. Did I write this down? I, ex I explained it in words anyway. So I said we're, we're expanding the path integral. So we take the saddle points, we sum over the saddle points, and for each saddle point, um, we expand and do quantum field theory around that saddle point. That's this contribution. Um, so this term here, how would we actually, how would we include this term? Um, so this is the ordinary Q of T path integral. In the metric, G bar, G bar mu nu. Uh, what do I mean by the ordinary QFT path integral? Well, I mean you have all the regular quantum fields, like the photon and all those, um, and then you also have the graviton. The graviton fluctuations, delta G mu nu, uh, but those we just treat as an ordinary quantum field. And remember, as long as we stick to low energies, there's nothing wrong with treating gravity as an effective field theory and doing quantum field theory with the graviton. Uh, but it's the graviton fluctuations around this choice of background metric. So what does this term give? Well, Now, when we talked about Hawking radiation, that's exactly the path integral that we were talking about. Okay, so 
so the quantum fields are doing what quantum field theory does on this Euclidean saddle point, the one that led to, Hawk, to, the, to the Hawking radiation. That's what the quantum fields are doing on this background. And that's included in the quantum corrections uh, to the calculation of the partition function. What that means, uh, well, we know, what the, we know what this path integral is. This is the quantum field theory path integral on this background. So this is the trace of e to the minus beta h of the QFT. Because this path integral prepares a thermal state on, uh, so this, this was what we called region A. This path integral prepares a thermal state on region A, and then doing the path integral with the cycle calculates the trace. So the point being um, that, at least formally, the quantum field part of this calculation is just calculating for you the partition function of the quantum fields uh, in this background in the usual way. So this will be e to the free energy, or log z q of t, will be the free energy of the quantum fields in the hartle hawking state, which was the state that you that's prepared by this path. Can you put a, a tilde there because you're just looking at one saddle? Uh, no, I put that there because I didn't do put a minus beta, one over beta or oh, something. Okay. Um, but they're also the other saddles. Well, I'm going to come back to this word formally uh, in a minute, but I, we could also, yeah, it's not really true. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you remind me what happens when our walking state is no longer like regular, like curves or something like that? Like, yeah, what? that's part of this formally. Yeah. What, ha I mean, what happens in this picture? Um, well, let me come to that in a minute. All right. I mean, in this picture, well, we can still draw the picture, but when you actually try to calculate it, it might not really make any sense. Trace of e to the minus beta h, does yeah. that make sense? Uh, right. right. It might, yeah, it might not really be a trace. Um, let's see. So, this is just the, like, this is just the usual free energy. Like, there will be a bunch of photons, there will be a photon gas, you calculate the free energy by the usual methods of electrodynamics. There will be a graviton gas, you have to calculate the, the free energy of the graviton gas, etc. for each of the quantum fields. You have to worry about things like gauge fixing and all that that you normally have to worry about when you do calculations in a perturbative theory with uh, gauge invariants or diff invariants. Um, Let's see if I want to say anything else about that. You can do this um, to any order in perturbation theory that you want. So this semi-classical expansion that I'm talking about <coughs> is a prescription, I would say, uh, that <coughs> can be extended to any order in perturbation theory around each set. So you can, you can sum up the saddles, you can find all the saddles, you can sum them up, where around each saddle you include all the interactions and expand to all orders in perturbation theory. Let's talk about this word formally. Okay, so um, there are some issues with doing this in flat space. There are issues with doing this in flat space. And uh, the issues are to be expected. Okay. So I mentioned this briefly last time, and then um, Amir reminded me about a great paper about this. So let me try to summarize the situation. So um, there, are, there are instabilities in flat space at finite temperature. Instabilities. flat space. 
So what are the instabilities? Well, suppose you just have an infinite flat space full of a gap, a thermal gas. Uh, that has a genes instability. So the genes instability is the fact that, gravi is that gravitating stuff wants to clump. And uh, you can't just put a bunch, you can't just have an a infinite volume of, of gravitating stuff. Any small fluctuation will cause it to clump. And then it'll clump more, and things will go nonlinear, and uh, it'll run away. Eventually, you'll form black holes if you do this, or planets, or us. Uh, so there's genes instability, uh, and there's also the issue that uh, we have multiple saddle points to worry about, and black holes can, can nucleate in hot flat space. Okay, so if you actually try to go through this calculation, you have to include the flat space saddle, and you have to include the Schwarzschild saddle, and what you find when you do these calculations is that there are imaginary parts in the free energy. Those correspond to the instabilities. Um, but uh, there really isn't a canonical ensemble. There really isn't a well-defined uh, z of beta for uh, flat space. That's not really a problem. It's, it's just the physics of, of gravitating stuff in flat space. It wants to clump, um, and it wants to um, run away once it clumps. So uh, that, that's, that prevents you from really uh, making this calculate. You can, you can do these calculations at one loop, but there'll be instabilities in imaginary parts when you go to higher loops. So you just told us something and then told us that's not true. Um, yeah, it's formally true. I mean, it's, it's not that you can't do anything. It's not that you can't do anything. You can, you can do this to one loop, and, and we got the right answer to one loop. To one loop, the answer is the uh, free energy. You get one contribution to the free energy from the graviton gas, and then you get the, the beta squared over 16 pi squared. Uh, but there are instabilities that you have to worry about uh, at higher loops. Um, I think the way to think about this physically is that if you, if you do experiments that are not sensitive to those instabilities, then these calculations are actually correct. So if you do experiments in a, in a finite box that don't last forever, uh, then you get a, a good approximation by, by, doing, by using these calculations. Yeah? Isn't this just a statement of how large delta G we know over here's a lot of Um, classically, it's a statement about those about about the higher order terms and the interactions of G mu. Uh, but quantum mechanically, there are also I think quantum mechanically we also have to worry, worry about tunning, tunneling. I mean, it's, delta G mu is not a number; it's a quantum field, so yeah. it's not just a matter of, of putting a magnitude on it. Yeah. Um, let's see. The la I guess the last thing I want to say about this is that um, everything works. Every life is nicer in ADS. You know, so, so that's the next thing we're going to do is going to go to ADS. I think that the issue of really understanding the gravitational path integral in asymptotically flat space is an unsolved problem. Okay, it's an unsolved problem. Uh, they're, they're, we can we can do calculations like this that work. They're, they make a lot of sense. They give you answers that are reasonable. We get the thermodynamics of the black hole, but I don't think we fully understand how to do gravitational path intervals in flat space because we don't understand what quantum gravity in flat space is, and it's hard. Uh, and and it's partly a conceptual issue issue with with making sense of quantum gravity, but it's partly a technical issue that. The calculations we'd like to do are things like the canonical ensemble, and there just isn't a canonical ensemble for good reason in flat space. And um, you know, in, so what should we do instead? Well, maybe we should study some metastable state of the black hole, but it's just hard to, to study metastable states uh, with a path integral, it, it, and, and so it, it leads to difficulties. Um, 
in anti-de-sitter space, uh, anti-de-sitter space is like, a, is like a natural box. Okay, so as we're going to discuss, uh, it's like a natural box. You, you can try to put actual flat space in a box by, by putting Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, it doesn't work terribly well because black holes might, might try to run out and eat your box or something. Okay, so so even, if you, even if you put boundary conditions in flat space, it's still, you still have difficulties. ADS is this natural box that doesn't let anything get to the edges. It's, like a, it's more like a, it's like a potential well. It doesn't let anything get to the edges, so it's a great box to work in. A lot of the issues that came up today um, don't, don't appear in ADS. The issue of, of counterterms and subtractions we already discussed. Uh, this issue um, is also not a problem. These instabilities are also not a problem in ADS. The, the, um, the quantum field theory terms, we can calculate the sum over saddles. We can even calculate in some situations. And, and a lot of these things are just much better under control. Does this mean that matter wouldn't clump to form a galaxy sometimes in ADS? No, the genes instability is still there. Um, yeah, let's see. The genes instability is still there, but but that one, there's nothing wrong with it, really. It's just a, it's a, it's a, there's a finite lifetime of the, of the hot gas. This one? Yeah. Oh, that I wrote that later. That didn't apply to this. Oh, I see. Sorry. That the all orders and perturbation theory was a statement about this equation over here. Okay. You sum over saddles and include the quantum corrections around the saddles. So now we're going to do. We're going to start talking about ADS CFT. I guess I'll make one more comment at this point, which is that people people were working really hard on on these gravitational path integrals, like in the 80s and 90s, and I, I think they got a little fed up with it. Like people were getting different answers to the to the same question um, because there were different ways of evaluating the path integral, and there was just a lot of like arguments about. What the right way, what the right contour was to pick, and stuff like that, and they didn't know how to how to decide, and and people got a little. Well, I'm I'm reading into the history here from from when I read, but um, it kind of felt they they stopped doing it. They they they, they couldn't answer some of these questions and um, stopped doing gravitational path integrals for a little while, and then ADS CFT came along in the late '90s. Uh, and gave us a situation where, in many cases, we not only are the calculations better controlled, we know what answer we know what the answer has to be by ADS CFT. And then, if you get into an ambiguity about what contour to pick or anything, you go to the you go to the dual CFT and, and ask what gives you a reasonable answer, and, and that's how you that's how you decide. So, it's really made a big difference in how we think about the gravitational path integral in the in the um, at least in ADS, we think we really know how to do gravitational path angles now. Okay. So that brings us to the next topic, which is the ADS-CFT correspondence. I'm going to start by uh, just introducing the basic players here. Um, we're not going to cover a whole lot of ADS-CFT in this course. Anyway, finite time, um, but I'm going to explain uh, enough of it in order to be able to talk about black hole thermodynamics in this context. So that's our goal, is really to talk about black holes and the black hole information paradox in the context of ADS-CFT. It's a huge subject, and we're not going to cover the rest of it. Let me start uh, with some motivational words. There's this thing called the holographic principle which was uh, first articulated by Etuft and um, 
also a couple years later uh, by Susskind in the early 90s, which says that all degrees of freedom in quantum gravity are associated to the boundary of space-time. If that sounds deep and mysterious, then good. It's supposed to. It's definitely mysterious, and it's uh, also deep. Um, what does that really mean? Well, um, we know what it means in ADS CFD. I don't know what it means in general. I wish I did. If I, if I knew, I would tell you. I don't know what this means. Okay, so. Um, but why, but why, do they, why do we think it's true or somehow true? Um, well, there's, there's various um, arguments that you can use. I'll give a couple of them. The first is uh, what we talked about in the very first lecture, which is that observables, uh, at least local observables in quantum gravity, are often defined in infinity or somehow tied to infinity like the S matrix. We said quantum gravity is sort of a theory of the S matrix, and it's hard to talk about uh, diffeomorphism invariant in observables that, that aren't tied to infinity. That's not a great argument. You know, maybe it's just hard. But uh, that was one of the earlier uh, hints. Where, where this uh, really um, A more convincing argument is this area law uh, for, the, for the black hole entropy. If the, if the entropy of a black hole is proportional to the area, um, then that's pretty weird because usually entropy goes as volume, as we discussed. But in fact, it's even, it's even there's a stronger statement. In fact, uh, Bekenstein showed that not only is the entropy of, of a black hole given by the area over 4, the entropy of anything is bounded by area over 4 in a theory uh, of gravity. So in any theory coupled to gravity, the entropy is bounded by area over four. There are various assumptions and caveats that go into this statement. This one that I've written is for static, spherically symmetric matter with some other conditions, like energy conditions. Um, but there's a version of this, actually, that's there's a version of this, an extended version of this, more recent, that's, that came after the holographic principle that's, that's stronger. For our purposes, this is good enough. So uh, why is this the case? Well, it's, e it's pretty simple. It's just if you try to put too much stuff together, it's going to collapse into a black hole. And when it collapses into a black hole, then the area is going to be, sorry, the entropy is going to be area over 4. So in fact, in any region of space-time, the most amount of entropy that you can have associated to that region is bounded by the area of the region. So that's pretty, that's, that's pretty striking and uh, underlies this, this idea of the holographic principle. As a third piece, um, let me give sort of a path integral way of thinking about this. Now, I, I introduced this formula, z of beta is the, uh, is the path integral on the Euclidean black hole, plus size beta. And I said that this is a possible, sorry, is a question? Yes, yeah, so this dummy would be true even in classical gravity? Um, well, yeah. Yeah, classical gravity. We have to we have to talk about what the entropy is, but yeah, 
stuff. Yeah, like if you have, you know, like a, a bunch of hot stuff that has entropy, like gas, and, and just coupled to classical gravity, this bound is true. So remember that this relationship between thermal partition functions and traces, in, in the gravitational path integral, this was just a postulate. Right? We, didn't, we didn't cut up the path integral and, and, and show that this was the trace like we did in quantum field theory. Um, but if gravity is holographic, then we're really only talking about the if gravity is holographic, then it sort of all lives on this circle out here, which I can't draw. OK, it's going to be red also. <laughs> if gravity is holographic, then it lives on the, on, on the boundary in some sense. Something, the degrees of freedom live on the boundary. And if these are quantum mechanical degrees of freedom that live on this boundary circle, then, uh, well, then we can cut that path integral. And the right way to do the trace is to is to allow is to put those is to put those degrees of freedom on a circle. So we kind of there's something already kind of holographic about the way that we've been treating the gravitational path in But then we have the inside black hole too. Yeah, we have to integrate over that. Oh, but you're saying because that's where we put the boundary conditions. Well, if, if, this, if the degrees of freedom are here, then, then that's where we cut the path integral for those degrees of freedom. And what happens elsewhere is just some, something that comes out of doing the integral. Another argument also, um, that there are no local observables of quantum gravity, because if you try to like probe something that's really small, you have to shoot it with very high energy and then it'll create black holes. Uh, yeah. That's, that's another also, argument. Is that also evidence for this? Um, I don't know. Is it? I don't really see. Well, it's well I, it, fits, it fits into number one, the, the fact that you don't have local observables, although it doesn't. It doesn't really explain why they have to be all the way at the boundary. Okay. So let's talk about the cosmological constant. And let's stick with maximally symmetric spaces, just so we have, just for concreteness here. So. Uh, the maximally symmetric space with a positive CC is the sitter. And um, global, let's, let's think about global de sitter. So global de sitter space is like, a, is like a sphere that's expanding. It has no boundary. I have no idea what the holographic principle is supposed to mean in a closed universe, like, a, like global de sitter space. Uh, this is totally mysterious. I, I don't know what this is supposed to mean. Um, so in a closed universe, uh, the holographic principle is very confusing. There are hints that it's still true. There's still things like black hole thermodynamics. There are horizons that you get into sitter space. Um, and there's a lot of reason to think that something holographic at work is going on, but we don't, we don't understand. So, um, are there any of how to make it work? Um, I would say that there's not a compelling story. There's a lot of little partial ideas and little partial models, but there's not a there's not some compelling. This is the way to think about it in the sitter space. So um, in flat space, um, the situation might be a little better. You know, the, the, there's a boundary now that we can go out near infinity. We just talked about boundary terms and stuff, the gravitational path integral. Um, but 
we don't really understand the holographic we don't really understand the holographic principle in flat space beyond this vague principle that I that I had written here. Okay, so this one uh, it, well, at least it has a boundary. You can talk about it holographically, uh, but we don't understand what those degrees, of, those mysterious de degrees of freedom might be. The ones that supposedly live at the boundary. Okay, so negative cosmological constant. Uh, that brings us to ADS CFT. So the the basic um, statement of ADS CFT is that in asymptotically anti-sitter, that's the ADS, um, the holographic principle is true. which is a conformal field theory. I'll state this in, in terms of explicit models uh, and, and more detail as we go, but that's the basic idea. The reason for the word asymptotically is because, of course, we're doing gravity. Uh, we get to pick boundary conditions. We don't get to pick manifolds. We don't get to pick space times. Uh, we get to pick boundary conditions. So this is what I'm what I'm stating here is a boundary condition on the metric. So with this boundary condition on the metric, which makes sense only for negative cosmological constant, otherwise it just it won't make any sense. Um, this is the this is the statement about gravity. Yeah. Why doesn't this space-like boundary consider you know do the job? It might. It it might. Um, People have tried, but. Yeah, I saw you were saying, you know, because somehow the null boundary is good enough, but the space like boundary is even worth considering or something. Right. Uh, well, I was really talking about global de Sitter, and the fact that it was closed was making it, was making it terrible. Uh, you're right, though, if we, if we talk about like the open slicing um, in de Sitter, then at least we have a boundary to deal with. It's a little more like the flat space case. Yeah. Could it be that like the reason why we see these like things that look like hints for the holographic principle uh, in black hole thermodynamics uh, in flat space, uh, flat space time and consider could it just be because like on small scales they look like it, they look the same as ADS does on small scales? Uh, yeah, but I would say everything is flat on small scales. Yeah. So I would turn it around and say that. If ADS, if, if ADS is holographic, well, if you go deep inside ADS, you can't tell you're in ADS. Right. All space is flat uh, and it, when you zoom in. And so if ADS is holographic, then gravity is holographic. It's just that we don't really know how to, how to implement it in detail in, in the other space times. Or at least the... Does it imply that it's actually holographic, or just that you would get like similar uh, properties of black holes because the small black holes won't be sensitive to the boundaries of the? Universe? Oh, I see. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure there's a difference. I, it, it means that there's something holographic about it, but extracting exactly what that something is—that's what—that's the mystery. We're going there's something very nice uh, that happens to the holographic principle in ADS CFT. And as far as I know, this was not like this was not expected earlier. And it's really sort of a, a gift of anti-de sitter space, which is that here uh, the degrees of freedom, these these mysterious degrees of freedom of quantum gravity associated to the boundary of space-time.
or a local quantum field theory. This is definitely not true in general. No, we don't know what holography means in, in flat space time, but it's definitely not a, a local quantum field theory uh, living at the edge. That, that, that's easy to just check uh, if, if that makes any sense, and, and it doesn't. Okay, so it's, it's not just some local quantum field theory. Um, and in, in ADS it is. Uh, so that's what gives us a duality. See, in, in ADS CFT, we have two ways that we can describe everything. We can do gravity in ADS, or we can study these boundary degrees of freedom directly on their own terms as a conformal field theory, and it gives us a duality. In, in other situations, it could be that gravity is holographic, but that we don't really have a duality like this because there's not some nice uh, other description that very well. Okay, I want to do a couple um, administrative things before we close. If we could turn off the video. Yeah.